I'm extremely pleased to introduce our host and our speaker today for the fourth of our Storytellers Education Series on Addiction, Depression, and Bipolar Disorder. Our host for these events is Angie Poirot, longtime well-known Bay Area radio personality, host and event producer for Kepler's Library Foundation, and freelance interviewer. Today, Angie will be in conversation with Dr. Alex Kaur, neuroscientist, author, educator, and best-selling author of The Upward Spiral, using neuroscience to reverse the course of depression, one small change at a time. In the other parts of his life, he has a wealth of experience in yoga and mindfulness, physical fitness, stand-up comedy, and serves as the coach of the UCLA Women's Ultimate Frisbee team. Please welcome Angie Coiro and Dr. Alex Korb. It's so good to see you, Dr. Alex Korb. How are you? I'm good. Great to be here. How are you, Dan? I'm well. Thank you. I know both of us cannot always say that because we're not only talking about those people over there, people with depression. You and I both deal with depression, so we're, we both know where up we speak. So I was pleased to know that about you in the book because it doesn't make you someone preaching from the mountain. You're, you're here in the trenches. Yeah. No, I mean, I, that was important to me when I was writing The Upward Spiral that, like, it not be just too didactic and just a list of, you know, a laundry list of instructions, uh, but actually, you know, compassionate and understanding the perspective, because a lot of times the things that we know that we should do, like, seem really simple, and yet our emotions get in the way, and science can sometimes just sort of, you know, make that very dry and clinical but then people don't actually use them. Right. But neuroscience matters so much here because otherwise it would be just a list of shoulds. You should exercise. We know that. You should get some sleep. We know that. But it's understanding what's happening in our brains at the same time. Why does that make a difference? Well, um, that's a great question. That's, that's basically the same question that my editor asked when I was first writing the book and I had turned in the first few chapters and she was like, why are you, you know, ex spending so much time like explaining what's happening in the brain? Like, just tell people what they can do. Uh, and I was like, well, I mean, I'm a neuroscientist. You knew that when I, you know, you decided to publish this book. So like, maybe you should have expected that. Uh, but also there's a couple things. Um, one, you can't always do something. Like that's one of the, the problems in our society. I call that sort of like the Silicon Valley view of happiness where you're like, okay, we just got to, you know, figure it out and find the right app and take the right supplement and then pivot and then do that. And like everything becomes about like trying to fix things and optimize and take action. And sometimes the answer is like, nope, can't do anything about it. Cause like, this is just how the human brain works. Mm -hmm. so like sometimes people with depression or anxiety, they, they tend to blame all of their negative feelings and experiences on the depression and anxiety when the truth is, well, even if you're, you get out of the depression or the anxiety and you're, you're better, like you're still going to experience anxiety. You're still going to experience heartbreak and disappointment. Like those are good things. Those emotions are a key part of life. And understanding that this is just a normal experience of having a human brain that helps uh, treat us ourselves with a bit more compassion and accepting of those experiences. And then on the other hand, you know, smart, successful uh, people aren't general like they don't generally just you know take something at face value and like oh okay I guess I should do this now like they want to understand well why should right. I do this and interestingly and this is when I like realized I was responding to my editor she was like why do they need to understand this I was like in some sense you don't like but there are a million books out there telling you, hey, you should exercise and sleep right. And like, we know all of these things. 
well, why don't we do them? Uh, because part of us is like, don't, don't really believe them. We're like, okay, yeah, yeah, I know. And I understand that, blah, blah, blah. But like, if you actually understood how it was affecting your brain and that you had the power to change your brain, then it can create a greater sense of like motivation to actually do these things. Mm -hmm. And it's actually very similar to um, what like psychiatrists do when they're talking about antidepressant medications. Uh, so like uh, an antidepressant medication might target the serotonin system and you're, you know, you're a depressed person talking to your psychiatrist and they're like, take this medication. You're like, Oh, does it have any side effects? Like if, uh, if they just were like, don't worry about it. Like understanding how it works, isn't going to help you. Well, like, you know, maybe it's technically true, but like, it's going to decrease your motivation to take it. Same thing. Like if you had cancer mm -hmm. and you went to see the oncologist and they were like, Oh, you got to take this chemo. It's going to have these terrible side effects. And you're like, oh, but so you know what's happening in my body with the cancer and what's the chemo going to do to help it? And if they're like, don't worry about that. It's not going to change how the medication works. Well, like that might technically be true, but it will greatly change your, you know, quality of life and experience and how you feel about the disease. And when it comes to things like depression, anxiety, where how you feel about having them is like 80% of the problem, then it's really critical to explain sort of what's going on. Mm -hmm. And so psychiatrists will explain, you know, uh, sometimes a bit too simplistically, like, oh, you know, your serotonin system is, you know, disrupted. And so you're going to take this medication and it's going to target the serotonin transporter molecule. And um, cause, you know, neuronal rewiring in the brain and that'll help you get better. And so someone might be like, going, uh, <laughs> a lot of us right, but so like, some people yeah. don't want to know that some people are like, okay, doctors, give me the pill. Okay, fine. Like if you want to follow just a list of instructions and you're like, okay, great. And you just dutifully do them. You probably don't have problems with like overthinking things. You know, you might have other problems with like, um, but uh, this, you know, this book isn't for everybody. Like it's for people who like want to understand uh, what's going on. And so like when a patient talks to a psychiatrist, they might ask like, oh, okay. So this, this pill is gonna like, I'm gonna feel better tomorrow. Like I'm gonna feel happy tomorrow. And they're like, ah, not, you know, not quite. Like it takes, you know, a while for the, the rewiring to happen. So like you might actually feel worse for a few days and, um, you know, but you know, in a couple of weeks, you'll probably start to feel somewhat better. And like, if after, you know, three months, like, yeah, you'll probably feel mostly better. And they, they can provide this scientific story that explains like what's probably gonna happen and what's going on in your brain. So when someone is worried about the side effects, they can know, ah, but I'm taking this pill, it's having these positive effects on my brain. And when they're frustrated that it's, you know, not working on day, you know, one or two, they're like, okay, I understand. The doctor said it takes time because, you know, the neurons have to grow and new synapses have to form. So I'm gonna keep taking it. Mm -hmm. And it's just that when it comes to all of these other helpful things in life that you don't need a psychiatrist to do, there's no one there to explain <laughs> to you like why they're helpful. Right. And so things like exercise um, uh, modulate the brain in a lot of similar ways to antidepressant medications. And you're not necessarily going to feel better right away, but like, ah, if you know that, then maybe when you don't feel immediately better on day one of exercising, you feel like, okay, well, let me just keep, keep at it for a few more weeks. It'll start to improve the quality of my sleep. It'll start to help uh, neurons grow. It'll change the, the dopamine system, the serotonin system, and I can stick with it because I know 
that it's changing these key brain circuits and chemicals. You know, I want to hasten to add my, my reference to eyes glazing over is actually I'm commending the book in that oh. if you get that partial explanation during a 15 minute interview or a 15 minute appointment, and then you're, you don't understand there's all this new information being thrown at you that you have no context for. And this is where the book fills in the blanks. Right. And that's one of the, like, I, I sometimes sound critical of psychiatrists, uh, but I recognize that like they're, they have a very challenging role to fill. Like they're not paid to, uh, or not given enough time to actually explain all these things. Right. Uh, and most people coming in to their office, like they don't even want to hear these complex answers. They're looking for the simple solution. So everything sort of points to like, ah, well, I don't have time to explain all the things in enough detail that you'll actually do them. So, um, so the easier thing is just write you a, a prescription. And it's, it's not that medication isn't helpful. It's extremely helpful. Mm. It's just not the full answer for everyone in every situation. About 40% um, of people will get completely better on the first medication they take. It might take a couple months. But like, that's kind of amazing. Like something as complex as human depression can be completely solved just by taking, you know, one pill a day. It's just that, well, you know, 30% of people are going to get, you know, a lot better, mostly better, but not quite all the way. They're still going to be kind of depressed. And another 30% of people are, it's not really going to help at all. So like, and unfortunately we don't know ahead of time which person is which that's actually what I went to grad school for I was like we got to be able to measure something about the brain that would tell us and like no nope, it's more complex it's than an, that it's an art as much as a science it really well is. it's uh I think uh uh yes there's some therapeutic art but also it's like you know how your the connection with your patient understanding them uh and so that's why I realized that we really need uh, something to like tell you what to do if you know the medication doesn't work completely for you or like which is actually one of the first things that I worked with as several psychiatrists in grad school you know I was in a, a psychiatric lab and they were wondering these same things and one of their studies they had was on yoga and it was like ah like that was one of the first light bulbs that led me down this path but like um you know these are the kinds of things that you can do if the medication doesn't work fully or like while you're sitting around waiting for the medication to work like you might as well do these things uh because they can often interact and make it even better or mm -hmm. while you're waiting for your you know psychiatrist visit that they couldn't schedule for a month like okay, might as well start uh, uh, doing these things. Worst case scenario, you're like, oh, sorry, doc, I'm not depressed anymore. Like, I got to cancel the visit. Uh, <laughs> not the worst case scenario. But, um, uh, or sometimes people have this, you know, big stigma against medication or, or mental health treatment, which they shouldn't. Because when you understand the mechanisms, you realize, oh, these are just different ways of modulating the brain. They're not like better or worse. Uh, but sometimes that stigma prevents people from taking these steps. And so you're like, okay, well, you can do all of these other things. And then, you know, maybe they'll work great. Or maybe they won't. But now you'll see like, ah, medication is, is you know, a, a good option that's left. I want to let people know if you have questions, you can put them in the chat window. And as we go along, we'll kind of work those in to our conversation. There's one thing, and this is before we get into the guts of the book. I just want to commend you for- a I think we're already in the guts of the book. <laughs> oh no, there's so much oh. more. <laughs> you have no idea. Um, there's, I just want to commend you for saying, for addressing the what's wrong with my brain. I'm gonna pick up this book and find out what's wrong with my brain. And that's not the way to come at this. I mean, it, it's not the most helpful way to 
to come at it, but that's where most people are at. Mm -hmm. um, like, uh, I mean, it's one of the reasons why I went into grad school because I was like, ah, oh, there's gotta be something that we could measure about the brain that would say like, oh yeah, this is broken or, you know, what's wrong to like diagnose people with depression. Uh, and, you know, because I'm a neuroscientist and I have access to an fMRI machine, people are always asking me like, oh, can't you just like stick me in there and like scan my brain and tell me what's wrong with me? You know, I feel like, you know, some part isn't connected the right way or like I'm missing, you know, some part of my brain or something. And uh, the truth is that there's nothing, quote unquote, wrong with the brain in depression. Uh, there's no brain scan or EEG or MRI or lab tests that can diagnose you with depression. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are, you know, some things that you could do maybe, maybe say like, oh, well, on average people with depression, you know, have higher say amygdala reactivity or something. Uh, but that's not a diagnosis that's taking, you know, 20 people with depression and 20 people without depression and putting them in very tightly controlled lab conditions. And you see, oh, statistically there's on average a difference. Uh, but that's like looking at, you know, the difference in heights between men and women and say, oh, on average, men are taller than women. But just because someone is five, nine, you can't diagnose them as being a man. Uh, the, like, there are certain circuits in the brain that like, yes, are more reactive in depression or under active, but it's not outside the range of what normal variation is. And you can't point to one particular region or circuit and say, ah, that's the problem. The problem arises from the tuning of like that circuit and, you know, of various other circuits in particular, it's a problem with the way the thinking, feeling, habit, and reward circuits in the brain are communicating with and regulating each other. And we've all got the same circuits. And they're right. all connected in the same ways. It's just that the, the specific tuning of like each circuit varies from person to person, just like our skin color varies or our eye color varies or our height varies or, um, you know, a whole bunch of other natural variation. And so there's nothing inherently, you know, better or worse about having, you know, a more reactive emotional circuit or a you know, some people worry more, some people worry less, some people are more decisive, some people are less decisive. In any given sort of trait or circuit, there's nothing inherently better or worse, but like the way they communicate and uh, regulate each other combined with the specific circumstances of your life may lead to problems. Sometimes that's a matter of like, oh, how can we you know, tweak the activity and chemistry of these brain circuits, either through medication or uh, go, getting a better night's sleep or exercise or gratitude or deep breathing. Sometimes it's like, you know, like if you have high reactivity in your worrying circuit and that disrupts your, you know, decision-making circuit so that, because, uh, you know, let's say you worry a lot, nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. That's just thinking about all the things that could go wrong. Uh, and, you know, thinking a lot about making decisions, nothing wrong with that. Like you're trying to make the right decision. The problem arises when like you worry a lot. And if you could just in the face of that, make a decision, well, then you move on with your life. But if your worrying disrupts your decision-making so that you don't move on, well, now you're just sort of left more to worry with and you get stuck. And that's just sort of an example how it works kind of in, uh, in miniature, but maybe that wouldn't even be a problem except for the specific job you're in requires you to make a lot of decisions. Right, right. And so there's nothing necessarily wrong with you. Like you could just like, yes, maybe you're depressed now, but like uh, if you just uh, switched jobs, <laughs> 
uh, then maybe it wouldn't be a problem anymore. But people are always trying to figure out like, no, there's something, they're starting with the assumption there's something broken about me or something wrong with me. And that's a very unhelpful and untrue place to start. I wanna start talking about the solutions that you offer and then talk about what's really going on in the brain with those. We hear a lot that we should exercise. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us think, okay, well, there are endorphins. There's the runner's high. And that's kind of as far as we really know about it. Mm -hmm. What's really happening? If I make the decision to even do five minutes of walking, what's happening? Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the, uh, I, I should I should say that like, you're saying that the understanding of it, okay, now we understand it. Like, what can you do? But in fact, like the understanding of it is a key thing that you can do because just, and this is this is a research study that came out after the book was published. And I was like, yeah, yes, perfect. This is exactly what I had hoped. And it basically said that simply understanding that um, you know, depression is, is arising from your brain biology and that your brain is malleable and can be reshaped, that helps reduce stigma and helps create a greater sense of agency. So I just sort of want to point that out before we think about like, oh, you know, that's not doing anything. No, that's doing something. But then, you know, that's just a sort of a changing your perspective. And then there's a lot of simple actions you can take, like exercise, that also have a lot of helpful effects. Um, one of the problems with exercise, though, is just the word exercise. Like it, it, it uh, brings up images of like being stuck in a sweaty gym with like loud music and like, you know, Anderson Cooper playing silently on a TV in the background or something, which is always seems to be the, you know, the, the background of airports and gyms. Uh, and that is really unappealing <laughs> to most people. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but that, uh, isn't the most helpful way to think about uh, the way how you can change your body or trying to change your brain through moving your body. It's really just about movement and uh, getting your body involved because our brain evolved in a body that you know used to be running around the Serengeti uh, all the time. And so you don't need to do formal exercise to start to get some of these benefits. Uh, so some of the simplest things are just like, well, making a decision to move that, um, and moving your body just changes some of the activity and serotonin circuits because you are, you're taking control and doing something, uh, as opposed to just sort of, you know, passively sitting there on the couch. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so some of the things about movement um, are, are important because it's people are often trying to figure out like, what's the best exercise that I can do or whatever. And like, that doesn't matter with the best exercises. What matters is, can you make any small change in, in how you move your body that is better than the default of what you're doing right now? Uh, and so sometimes when people you know, think about, oh, okay, I have to go exercise. I got to run a 5k and they're stuck on the couch all day. They're like, well, I could never do that. So I'm just not going to make any change. Right. But if you just start focusing on what are the small ways that I can move my body instead of focusing on the big, huge exercise plan that, you know, I'm never going to actually do, that's much more helpful. Um, if I can interrupt you on that point, and this yeah. is a really good time to talk about how perfectionism comes into the picture. It's, it's hard for some folks to look at someone who's sitting on the couch and saying that there is a perfectionist, but often that's a perfectionist who's looking at the picture and saying, I am not going to get up and walk a block. That's not good enough. Yeah. And this is one of the problems that I found with a lot of the studies on it. Like, um, uh, a lot of, you know, medical studies say, you know, okay, if you prescribe someone 
uh, like they think about it, you know, as just the, okay, what's the one solution that's going to solve everything. And so like, if you prescribe someone exercise, what's the, the dose of exercise that you need to prescribe to have it be effective. And they'll, they sort of, there's research that like, well, you know, you have to reach this sort of like level of where you're doing it three times a week, you know, three to five times a week for 45 minutes a day. And you have to do it for at least 10 weeks. And for many people, it's like, ah, well, I'm never going to be able to do that. Uh, but that's, that's from the framework of if you're trying to think of exercise as the one thing that you're doing as a replacement for taking a medication, that's the one thing that you're doing. And everyone keeps trying to figure out like, what's the one thing that's going to fix it all. And for most people, there isn't one thing <laughs> like right. you could be lucky, uh, but stop trying to look for the one thing that's going to fix everything and just start doing helpful stuff. Uh, so like getting up off the couch and walking around the block is not going to solve your depression, mm -hmm. but it's a heck of a lot better than doing nothing and sitting on a couch all day, because maybe if you can just walk around the block for, uh, you know, one day, uh, uh, every day for a week, well, you know, you're creating a little bit of intention and you're taking action and you're getting some sunlight. Uh, you're setting the precedent that like, hmm, I can, I can take action even when I don't really feel like it. And then, you know, next week, maybe you can walk around two blocks or maybe after you're walking for a little bit, you're like, oh, let me try jogging. It doesn't seem quite so unapproachable when I've already been walking for five minutes than when I'm sitting on the couch. Right. Uh, so your perceptions can change based on the actions that you take and the environment that you're in. And sometimes people won't let them take tiny little helpful actions because they're not the perfect thing that's going to solve everything. Right. Uh, but even just small amounts and, you know, so starting to get your body moving is really helpful because uh, inactivity is problematic for you. It causes all these, you know, negative health outcomes. So like, you don't need to, the first step isn't always like start exercising. It's just like, well, stop being inactive all right. the time. Like get up out of your chair once an hour, like literally for like 10 seconds, that's not going to sit back down or like just walk around the block in the morning. Like that's not going to solve everything, but it's a great place to start from there. If you can, you know, bump up the intensity uh, or bump up the duration for, you know, a, a 30 minute brisk walk or just, you know, a 10 minute bike ride, that's going to have even further effects. For example, there's a great study where they took, um, uh, well, one study that met, used, um, uh, these two different studies used stationary bikes, uh, which I think I mentioned in our, our pre-interview, scientists love stationary bikes because it makes it so much easier to record from someone's brain when you don't have to chase after them, uh, which I say is a joke, but like there are tons of studies on these things because they're easier to study not because they are the best things for you to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and so these two studies, one study on stationary bikes looked at um, subtle blood flow changes in the brain using infrared light sensors. And they found that just 15 minutes of biking was sufficient to increase activity in these sort of prefrontal thinking circuits that are responsible for emotional control. And it also boosted serotonin which is the, the key chemical system targeted by antidepressant medications. Mm -hmm. uh, another study took smokers uh, and had them, you know, not smoke for 24 hours. <laughs> so they're like really, you know, uh, antsy and like really uh, oh, craving <laughs> a cigarette. Uh, and then they stuck them in an fMRI machine to look at their brain activity. Uh, while they showed them pictures of cigarettes to like see how strong their cravings were. But before they did that, they took half the people and had them ride on a stationary bike for 10 minutes. And just that brief amount of exercise, moderate, you know, intensity, nothing crazy, uh, was sufficient to reduce their cravings 
So they didn't feel, you know, pulled as strongly once they saw the cigarettes. And that was accompanied by changes in the, in the activity in the habit circuit in the brain. Because normally what happens is there's some trigger like, oh, you see a picture of a cigarette and you're like, oh, I really need a cigarette. And then that, you know, triggers all these emotions. And then it just sort of like pulls you down some path. And like, yes, you can resist it insofar as, you know, your prefrontal cortex is working properly or you're paying attention uh, or you've, you know, slept enough or you're not too stressed out. Uh, but when your stress levels go up or uh, you get distracted for a moment, well, your habit circuit just sort of takes over and pulls you down that path. Mm -hmm. And, but just, you know, 10, 15 minutes of biking helps strengthen those prefrontal circuits and it helps reduce the reactivity of the habit circuit. And that is not in and of itself gonna like cure your addiction, but it definitely makes it a lot easier to make positive choices when you don't feel so strongly pulled into these bad habits. And over time, you know, the easier you make it to make positive choices, well, the more likely you are to do it. And that those changes in your actions will start to have further effects in your brain that make them more automatic in the future. You said, in fact, that e even just planning, the planning of the exercise can activate your prefrontal cortex, which yeah. I find just amazing. You're not even doing it yet. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think uh, like that is one of the things, by the way, I think that why planning these big exercise interventions, it like is a, is a trap that people get stuck in because they're like, oh, okay, New Year's, I'm going to go to get a gym membership and I go, you know five times a week for like two hours every day. And it's going to solve everything. And like, that is actually like the planning of that is actually helpful in like coming down your stress, giving you a greater sense of control over the world. Uh, the problem with it is that like, then when it comes time to do this big grand plan, uh, it feels overwhelming and you're overwhelmed by your emotions. And so then you don't actually do it. So yes, planning is helpful and taking action is helpful. And ideally you want to create plans that make it easier to take action. And then as you take action, that's going to change your emotions, which makes it easier to plan and take action. And that sort of the essence of the upward spiral. Uh, and the reason so many of us get caught in, in these sort of loops or in a downward spiral is not usually for bad reasons, it's for good reasons. We get excited. Oh, I, I just heard this talk about exercise and oh, I could you know, solve every all of my problems with exercise and like, okay, I'm gonna come up with a big plan. But then, you know, at some point your emotions just get in the way or you have this flicker of self doubt or like you try it for, you know, a week and it doesn't solve everything. And so then your, you know, your disappointment kicks in because you have a very reactive, you know, reward circuitry. And you're like, ah, oh, didn't solve everything. Ah, oh, therefore it was pointless and useless. What's the, you know, I'm going to give up. Right. And uh, it's helpful to realize like, okay, you know, all of these things are sort of going on at the same time. So there's nothing wrong with creating some big grand plan to inspire you. Like, hey, I'm going to, win a gold medal i have a friend who's like 40 who's like i want to find some olympic sport that i could learn and like he has like dual citizenship in latvia and he's like i'm gonna you know train for the olympics and make the latvian team and uh he decided archery was the best way to accomplish that and it's like great sure like if that's gonna like motivate you to like get out of the house and like focus and like feel like you're making sense of progress sure plan to make the olympics but if your big grand plan is anything other than like motivating and inspiring you and instead starts to feel overwhelming and oppressive well then stop <laughs> focusing on this big grand plan instead make much smaller tinier plans 
that help you take a little bit of action in the right direction. And you'll have some thought that's like, yeah, but that's not going to fix everything. And you just need to realize like, ah, that's just the habit circuit in my brain, uh, you know, trying to prevent me from feeling too disappointed and like, ah, it's trying to help just like your friend, you, you might say to your friend, like, Hey, I'm going to start a new business or I'm going to open up a new restaurant. And they may be like, yeah, restaurants usually fail in their first year. And like, does that mean you shouldn't open up a restaurant? No, maybe it means you should talk to a different friend. Uh, and so we, all these different brain regions, they want different things. They evolve for different purposes. They're like different friends that we have. And sometimes we get stuck because we're listening to you know the practical friend when we really should be listening to our fun, inspiring friend. But you know, when it comes time to do your taxes and you're listening to your friend who's like, yeah, no, let's go to Vegas. Like, well, that's <laughs> unhelpful. So like you want to use, the, you know, the world is complex and your brain is complex and you, it has all these different tools and you just want to make sure you're using the right tool for the specific thing that you're trying to accomplish. And sometimes we're trying to accomplish, you know, feeling more fun and happy emotions. And sometimes we're trying to like, do things that are meaningful or accomplish something which aren't always fun and happy. And then we get stuck because, you know, we have these sort of mental habits that when something isn't fun, we're like, oh, this isn't fun. Instead of just being like, yeah, it's not supposed to be fun. It's supposed to help you feel happier over the next week. So maybe you could suck it up and feel a little, you know, not quite as happy for the next 10 minutes to help yourself in the long run. Well, that kind of takes us right out of exercise and into decision-making because decision-making sure. is, is the second category that we're talking about for improvement. And what surprised me about that is that if you can make a decision, it's gonna forward how you're doing, even if it ends up being the wrong decision, which is kind of counterintuitive. Yeah, no, I mean, again, it goes sort of back to perfectionism that a lot of times we're stuck is because we're, trying to make the best decision, the perfect decision. Like right now we're trying to like, uh, we need a new air conditioner. And I'm like, oh, this one is more energy efficient. And this one is, you know, uh, cheaper. And this one, you know, this one's cheaper to install, but oh, that one's like cheaper to run in the long term. And like this one, it's, you know, because of the supply chain, it's, you know, in stock and we could have it you know, ready in, you know, a couple of weeks, whereas the other one, I don't know, maybe it would be like five months. And so like, which one should I choose? There's, there's no best decision because there isn't one that's like, well, cheaper and more efficient and like is the best in every category. So um, the more that I focus on like trying to make the best, the more that I'm going to focus on like, ah, well, this one doesn't have that feature and this one doesn't have that. And I'm going to focus on what I'm missing out on, which just makes me feel worse about the assortment of decisions that I have in front of me. And you um, still don't have an air conditioner. Right. And which is, it is the only relevant thing to pay attention to, which is like, ah, could I survive in my house without air conditioning? No. Do I have money to buy an air conditioning, yes. Okay, then therefore the only wrong decision is to do nothing. And so if I compare any of these choices, any of these choices is better than the default. Oh, well then it feels easier to, um, uh, to make a decision because I can choose up any of these good decisions instead of trying to make the best one. And if at some point in the future, I realize, ah, like I should have got the one that was more energy efficient. Well, oftentimes we get angry and upset with ourselves. Uh, but like that is in fact one of the reasons why it becomes so hard to make decisions is because we're predicting that if we make the wrong one, we're gonna get really mad at ourselves. So we're trying to avoid our own self-criticism 
And that just keeps you stuck because like, well, if you know the right answer, take it. Like if you know the right direction, go in it. And if you don't know it, then just sitting there stewing over it and, you know, worrying about it for another week isn't going to answer the question. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, it's only going to make you fall back on the default of not making a decision, which you've already decided is the worst outcome. And so once you sort of remove the fear of uh, not trying to make the perfect, absolutely best decision, then like, okay, I may make a decision. It might be a little bit wrong. It might be a lot wrong, but like then from there, I can make another decision. Uh, and like, if I start doing something and I realize like, oh, this is actually a hundred percent wrong, then great. I can go back to where I started and go in the opposite direction. And if you're really self-critical, it prevents you from doing that because you're like, oh, but then it would be so pointless any action that I would take. But in fact, going somewhere, realizing it is the wrong direction, coming back to where you started and going in a different direction is, is better than sitting there and doing nothing at all because now you've eliminated one possibility. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, I definitely know that's not the answer. And, uh, and now of the remaining answers, I can approach them with even more commitment and excitement. And, uh, and this is in fact, is exactly how science works. Every scientist would love like, oh, if my experiment just worked out perfectly, exactly as I, you know, hypothesized, but it doesn't, right. that doesn't mean you shouldn't experiment. Like, yes, if you know the answer, okay, then you're, you're not at the, the boundary of knowledge. If you know the answer, do it. And if you don't know the answer, you have to experiment. And when your experiment is not 100% correct, that means you've learned something new. So don't yell at yourself and berate yourself. It's so stupid to do that experiment. You say, ah, great. Now I will incorporate that new knowledge and design another experiment. And that one will be, you know, either slightly better or slightly worse. And I'll, but either way, I'll keep learning stuff and continue to sort of, uh, you know, explore my way along to how I find this, you know, happier, more fulfilled life. And that's perspective too. You mentioned early in the book to, to avoid uh, being a catastrophist, avoid catastrophizing everything. And you can get so wrapped up in which air conditioner to buy that it helps to step back and say, nobody's gonna die here. Yeah. No matter what I get, no one's gonna die. My kids are still fine. You know, I still have enough money, whatever, just some level of perspective. And yeah. that goes to a point you make about setting your priorities, wondering about what's, you know, setting out what's important to you. And I think that that helps with the act of getting perspective. Yeah. Now, I mean, since I wrote the book, um, like a lot of people emailed me and was like, oh, I, you know, this is great, but like, I need more help applying it to my life. And at first I was sort of annoyed at all these people, like, you know, getting in the way of me doing my work. And then I was like, oh, but I like helping people. Like maybe I should, uh, start helping them. <laughs> uh, and so that's why I started doing like personal coaching. And one of the things that I realized, like that I was just kept repeating over and over again, is sort of exactly this point about priorities mm -hmm. is that it's really important to get clear on what is more important to you and what is less important to you. And on the, if you sort of think about it as a, as a 2D graph, um, on the other axis is like, well, what is controllable and what is less controllable? Uh, and that sort of creates, you know, four different quadrants uh, where something might be really important to you, but you don't have control over it. Right. Uh, so it's not worth, like it might be really important to me to find the best air conditioner, but I don't know <laughs> what that is. And I don't know how I will feel, you know, to save more money now versus saving more money later or whatever. Like, and so 
uh, it might be really important, but focusing on this uncontrollable thing just stresses me out. Uh, and then there's like the things that are controllable, but like unimportant. And, you know, I might be wanting to um, write a novel or um, find a new job or some, or, you know, work on a report, like some big task that is kind of stressful because it's important to me. Uh, but, well, why don't I just, you know, watch Netflix for a little bit or, you know, just fold some laundry, like, ah, that's something that's easy to do, but <laughs> it's not actually important. Uh, but it's very easy for the habit and reward circuitry of your brain to just like pull you into those things. Uh, but when you sort of identify those, you realize, ah, when it comes to the, the area of the, the, you know, sort of the graph of things that are uncontrollable, whether they are important or not, uh, the only useful path forward is to either think about them differently so that they don't bother me. Uh, so, you know, I can minimize the consequences like, oh, what's the worst that could happen when if I choose the wrong air conditioner? Well, like it'll be a few thousand more dollars. What's the worst case scenario if I don't choose an air conditioner? Well, I'll be miserable, you know, living in this house. Ah, okay. So like the difference between choosing the absolute best air conditioner and like the, you know, the worst air conditioner is still better off. So like the, the consequences aren't so bad, even though I don't know, it's still uncontrollable, but the consequences aren't so bad. That's how it's sort of reframing it. Uh, the other thing that you can do in the face of uncontrollables is to just accept them and experience them. Uh, and you might not want to, but like, that's sort of the nature of it. Like, I might not want to accept that how expensive this is going to be, or I might not want to accept that I am depressed. Well, it doesn't change anything about the world. Now I'm just angry at how expensive it's going to be, or I'm angry at myself for being depressed. So acceptance is not uh, like accepting that things should be this way. Yeah. It's simply acknowledging, ah, they are this way and I can't control it. And then that allows you to stop being so distracted by the things that you can't control uh, and focus on the things that are important. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, there are also this other area of things that are uh, controllable, but unimportant. And so if, unless you are sort of clear about like, you know, why you are doing these big things in your life, well, I'm not, you know, working on this novel just because it's difficult. I'm not trying to find a new job for no reason. It's because, you know, I'm passionate about something or like, oh, I want to make more money. And like, I don't want to make more money for no reason, I want to support my family and give my kids a better life. Like, so, ah, so that's the priority. That's why I should spend the next hour, you know, filling out my resume and, um, uh, you know, uh, applying to jobs as opposed to watching Netflix. Right. Because, yes, I'm I'm worried that um, uh, finding this job, a better job might be out of my control, but sort of doesn't matter. It's the only thing that's going to move me towards the things right. it's the the most important to me. Right. right. If you don't have the, that clarity about like what is actually important to you, then the habit and impulse brain, parts of your brain, they're always just going to like take over and be like, oh, don't worry about all that. Like, let's just do these simple things that don't matter at all. And one of the challenges, by the way, with that is that um, almost always the reason we're stuck is because we think certain things are controllable when in fact they aren't, <laughs> or we think that certain things are uncontrollable when in fact we could change them, or we think something is really important to us, but it's not actually, <laughs> and vice versa. 
And, uh, but you only learn about your mistakes by taking action and something is happening. And like, oh, I realized I keep banging my head against the same wall over and over again for the last six months. Ah, maybe I should do it a different way. Like, oh, I keep being unhappy at my job no matter what I do. Ah, maybe I should find a different job. Or I keep being unhappy no matter which job I take. Ah, maybe I should reframe my thinking or, uh, or try and understand what's actually important to me. And when you are feeling stuck and frustrated and down, you don't actually know th- like which thing is wrong. But the one thing you know for certain that if you just sort of sit there and do nothing or nothing different anyway, then nothing is going to change because your habits and your impulses will always, and the circumstances of your life will always bring you back to the same spot. And so what we're, what we end up is sort of often doing is just sort of hoping that the circumstances of our life will change so that, oh, it'll just become obvious to me or like that, that the easy thing and the thing that I want, the most important thing will become magically the same thing. Like, wouldn't that be wonderful? That and sometimes wonderful. it's true. Sometimes <laughs> it's true. Sometimes the thing that you really want uh, in the long term is also the easy thing. Wonderful. You should be so grateful. But a lot of times they aren't. And so you need you just need to make a choice like, ah, I could do this easy thing. That's what my habit, you know, reward circuit wants me to do. But that's kind of why I'm still stuck in this position that I am in. So like, I'm going to do this other thing, not because it's hard, not for no reason, but because it's important. And therefore, when I start doing it and it is hard and my habit circuit is like, you moron, why are you doing this? It's so hard. This would be so much easier to do this other thing. You can say, correct. I could do this other thing that's easier. I'm not doing this just because it is hard. I'm not torturing myself for no reason. I'm doing it for this big, important reason. And acknowledging you know, uh, your goals and values actually helps uh, get your stress response under control. And it helps sort of like quiet down uh, these regions that are sometimes pulling you off track. I want to jump over to the chat box where Sarah has a question. How do you yeah. help someone to choose to experiment when they're trapped in sadness? They don't feel pleasure by doing new activities or choosing new paths or actions. Yeah. So that's one of the challenging things is that a lot of times people, you know, read the book because they're like, I need to get my, you know, partner to change or my, you know, spouse to change or my friend to change in all of these things. And it's uh, really frustrating and difficult. Um, But it's helpful to remember that like, however frustrated you are, that you can't change their feelings, they are much more frustrated. Uh, And in fact, sometimes we inadvertently make things harder on someone with depression because we're like, ah, I know what you need to do. You just need to do this and this and this. And like, well, they didn't ask you probably because they already knew that they should be doing those things. And there's a reason that they're not doing those things. So just telling them that often makes them feel judged because you're like, you're right. It should be so easy to do these things, but I'm not doing them. I'm you know miserable and worthless. Uh, and so even though you think you might have the right answer, that's going to fix someone, uh, you can always feel free to ask them about it, but don't be so married to your correct answer as fixing them uh, that you overlook like, well, why, you know, what is difficult that gets in the way of them doing that? Mm -hmm. And that is much more about empathy, and validating their feelings and trying to understand their perspective than it is 
about telling them the right perfect thing and giving them the right laundry list that's going to fix all of their problems. Because part of their issue oftentimes is like, they're trying to fix all of these feelings as well. And so when you come in and you try and fix everything, well, like, you can't fix feelings. They're not broken. They just kind of are. Right. Uh, and so uh, the, one of the biggest things that you can do to help someone else is to just validate their feelings. Cause they're like, ah, I'm so depressed, but I shouldn't be. Ah, yeah, that must be really frustrating. <laughs> uh, because we always think like, oh, depression only makes sense if some terror, if your life is terrible. And we're like, okay, it makes sense when someone's depressed, but like depression, depression can just arise from the communication of these brain circuits. It doesn't have to have a specific cause. And so uh, if you can just sort of, you know, sit with them, like, oh, yeah, that's really frustrating. Like, I just want to let you know that I'm there for you. That's one of the most powerful things as well. And then, you know, just trying to lead them like a little bit based on where they are. Um, I like to sort of think of it sometimes like when you're like feeling really down, like if you just like listen to really, you know, exciting, happy music, you, like it, it like just kind of makes you feel worse. Like you, like you don't connect with it at all. But if you listen to a song that's kind of like sad and down, like, okay, you know, this, you know, I feel connected to this music and if the music like slowly, you know, builds and whatever, like, oh, okay, it's taking me along for the ride. So a lot of times when we come into someone else's life, we're like yeah. trying to drag them and shake them out of where they are instead of like, hey, let me, you know, climb in there with you. And like, hey, now that we're in this together, hey, let's, you know, let's, let's move it a little bit uh, along here. And you can, uh, like just that connection is really powerful, letting someone know that you're there for them. And then keep, suggesting things for you to do together because a lot of times you know it's really easy for me to say to you like hey you should exercise more no crap like of course like that's so easy for me to say much harder for you to do uh so instead if i was like hey like if i made it more challenging on myself i could take some of the burden off you like hey let's um let's go for a walk tomorrow well like that's much more helpful than just telling you to exercise because i am putting my skin in the game and then you get the benefit of walking but also social uh interaction uh and then you don't have to have quite as much willpower uh to overcome you know your negative thoughts and go for a walk because like I'm knocking on the door, uh, okay, it's just easier to just go for the walk. Like, right. um, so that's, uh, uh, oftentimes we like put the burden of planning and the burden of thinking of these ideas on the other person instead of just like, well, let me create the activity and make it really easy for them to join in and say yes. And if they say no, don't, get all mad at them. Like even sort of like even notice in your own mind, you're like, oh, it's so frustrating. I'm, I'm doing everything and they're just not listening. Well, like we're, people are very perceptive about other people's, you know, emotional reactions. And if, if you like, Hey, let's go for a walk tomorrow. And they're like, Oh, I just, I just can't. And you like, you're like, Oh, really? Like, Oh, like, you know, you just have a little hint of disappointment in your voice. Like it's because you're kind of like, ah, they're not really trying or whatever. Like you're being slightly judgmental. They feel that and that makes them feel worse. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's always helpful to recognize like, hey, it's okay. You can't control your feelings. Your feelings are valid and understandable. And I'm here to support you. And like, I'm going to keep uh, you know, trying to help you take positive actions. And I know it's not always going to work, but like, I just, you know, I'm going to, I'm committed to you. I'm not, because otherwise, if you're not committed to that person, 
you're basically like, oh, I'm committed to fixing you. That's not the same thing. Like I'm committed to being right because I know the right answer and you need to just listen to me. That's not very helpful. Lots of questions coming in all of a sudden. If you have questions, put them in the chat box. We'll get to these. Because I talk so much and I don't quite make sense. And so then. <laughs> I'm getting most of this. Um, Paula says, what about people who have depression tied to drug abuse, methamphetamines in this case? Yeah. So um, I sort of said, sometimes depression doesn't have a cause, like a, a specific cause that we can identify. Uh, but sometimes it does. <laughs> Uh, but even so, like, even if you think there's a very clear cause that might not be the total cause. Uh, um, but if there is something that clearly is a big problem in that person's life, well, then trying to eliminate that cause might solve everything. Like some people are depressed because of drug use. Some people are depressed because they're in an abusive relationship or a terrible job. And like, if they just change their circumstances, oh, they wouldn't be depressed anymore. Uh, it's sort of like if there is a traffic jam on the freeway, and because I'm from Los Angeles, I think of everything in terms of traffic and cars. Uh, so there's a traffic jam on the freeway uh, that's caused by an accident. You know, there's cars blocking two of the lanes. Okay, well, let's try moving that accident. <laughs> and the traffic jam should clear up. Now, it's not always as simple as that because there are often times where there could be a car accident and no big, huge traffic jam. Cause it depends on like, yes, the traffic jam increases. I mean, the, the car accident increases the likelihood that there will be a traffic jam, but depending on, you know, what time of day and how many other cars and, you know, how many lanes it's blocking, it might not actually be a problem, but, also, once you remove the cause or the apparent cause, because I said the cause is not just the traffic, it's not just the accident, it's also the thousands of other cars that are on the road. Right. So it, it seems like, oh, this is the cause, it's going to cause everything, and I take it away and it fixes everything. That's not necessarily true because I could remove the traffic jam, uh, the, the car accident, and yet there's still a traffic jam that persists for, you know, uh, minutes or hours after because of all of these, you know, cars and they're sort of like a standing wave. And uh, that doesn't mean it was stupid of you to remove the accident. It just means there's more complex dynamics at play. So if someone is, um, you know, has a drug problem or an alcohol problem or some, or, you know, they're unemployed or whatever, okay, well, like try getting a job or like try, going into treatment that often, even if it doesn't fix the whole problem, is going to make it a lot better. Um, uh, but this, by the way, is one of the reasons why it's sort of like a downward spiral because like alcohol, you know, or, or, or drug abuse can sort of uh, push you further into depression. And then maybe because you're depressed, like nothing seems enjoyable or appealing except what's most immediately rewarding. And so then you just sort of get uh, stuck. Uh, but one great thing uh, that I, I've read in the research about um, drug addiction is one of the problems is that it disrupts our natural sense of reward. Like normally yeah, you enjoy eating and you enjoy social connections, but that gets disrupted by drugs of abuse. And um, the good news though, is that you can disrupt that disruption through things like social connection. When we connect with other people uh, and have close connections, it releases this chemical oxytocin that helps us feel more connected and supported and trusting. And it actually reduces um, the stress response in our body. Um, it can, uh, you know, make our, our brains more resilient against stress, and it sort of disrupts the these drugs of abuse from hijacking our nervous system. Like there's cool studies where, like, if you give rats like methamphetamine, <laughs> you can see that they're like 
run all over the place and you can see that their like reward centers like light up a huge amount. If you give them methamphetamine plus a boost of oxytocin, which is this like social, you know, the love hormone it's sometimes called, well then yes, they're still running around all over the place, but like not all the way up off the charts or, you know, down here. Uh, and the reward circuitry, yeah, still gets activated, but like it's not um, through the roof. And so social support, you know, it's not going to necessarily solve everything, but it, like it makes it a little bit easier to make a positive choice when, uh, you know, the reward circuitry isn't like yanking you with all of its might to take drugs. It's just kind of like, suggesting it. So if I'm hearing you right, and Paul is asking about depression concurrent with methamphetamine abuse. Mm -hmm. If I'm hearing you right, the very act of changing some of what you do, producing oxytocin, mm -hmm. you, uh, doing things that deliberately produce oxytocin, that in fact can help with the abuse. Yeah. I mean, I mean, this is part of the problem. Like people often end up in this like abuse and shame and depression spiral where like you know they have all of these negative emotions and often they feel you know self-critical and like disconnected or judged uh by people and so uh, well it's just easier to take this drug it just makes me feel better for a moment i guess sort of let go of all of these um you know negative emotions for a while the problem is it doesn't solve the source of the negative emotions. It just like gives you a brief break and your habit system is like, oh yeah, that sounds really good. And so the next time you're feeling down, well, the drugs, the pull of drugs become even stronger because they helped you escape. Um, uh, but then you're just sort of like stuck in this loop. And if you could help someone be less, you know, self-critical, like, oh, I'm such a worthless person. Well, then like they wouldn't feel as stressed and pulled into needing drugs to solve those feelings. Uh, and um, just that positive sense of connection helps reduce the rewarding aspects of those drugs, partly because they're, you know, taking it to deal with their sense of disconnection and self-criticism. Mm -hmm. But it's painful, by the way. Like, if you're you're dealing with an addict, sometimes people like they don't want to feel that compassion because it makes them feel emotions deeply, both positive and negative emotions, and that's that's basically an activation of the brain's emotional circuitry, which automatically activates the habit circuit to try and like okay get that back under control. And that's part of the, the problem. They're stuck in this, like they can't deal with all their intense emotions. They found a really successful way to deal with them temporarily. Uh, and so this is why it's not a straightforward path, even though, you know, trying to connect with them and support them, you know, will help them out. Like they're often going to be resisting it because of their own habits of self-criticism and shame. Uh, Dan, who's watching us, uh, wants to hear more about the, the neuroscience behind the advice and explanations. And I think that is a perfect lead into talking about biofeedback as, mm -hmm. as a trail to the upward spiral. Because in that, in that chapter, you say the brain changes activity based on what the body is doing. And yeah. all the things mom used to say, stop making that face, smile, stand up straight that does stuff to your brain. What does yeah. it do to your brain? Yeah, so th that biofeedback um, is just sort of like the broader idea that I was talking about in exercise. Like movement is one way to use your body to affect your brain. The reason, by the way, I call it biofeedback is because what's happening in your body affects your brain and then your brain is paying attention to that and it changes what's happening in your body. And so it's a feedback loop. Sometimes the easiest place to disrupt that is like, oh, changing your thoughts or changing something that's happening in your brain. But sometimes the easiest thing to do is just change what you are doing with your body and it's gonna change the signals going to the brain and so on. Uh, so physical movement, one way to do that. 
Uh, one of the biggest things though, is by changing your breathing. Uh, breathing is a really interesting aspect of our physiology because uh, it's, it's uh, life-sustaining and automatic, but also we have conscious control over it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you've probably been breathing this whole time, <laughs> but if I told you to like, hey, can you stop breathing? Or could you slow down your breathing? You could do that. The same is not true of other aspects of your physiology. You can't say, mm, I want my liver to work harder right now, or like, oh, I wanna speed up my heart or slow down my digestion. Uh, and so uh, because we have this conscious control over breathing, we can intervene in a really helpful way. Um, normally what happens when we're stressed is that our breathing rate increases, our heart rate increases, you know, we sweat more, our pupils dilate, we, you know, our limbs, our muscles, uh, feel shaky. Uh, but if you can slow down and smooth out your breathing, then you can push the brain away from this, uh, what's called the, the, you know, the fight or flight response and towards the complementary rest and digest response, which has a whole other set of uh, nerves devoted to that, that slow down our heart and, uh, you know, make us stop sweating uh, and calm us down. And that's a great thing to be aware of because like breathing is a very concrete thing. You, you can tell if you're doing it and all you need to do is just like slow it down to about five breaths per minute, mm -hmm. um, which our normal range is about 12 to 16 breaths per minute. So uh, the way you can, you can think of it is like, okay, inhale for about five seconds, one, two, three, four, five, and pause for a second. And then exhale for the same count and pause for a second and then inhale. And uh, it's shown that inhaling through the nose has a greater effect on our physiology, like um, uh, lowering our blood pressure. Uh, so I recommend inhaling through your nose and exhaling whatever feels most comfortable. But the key is not how deep you breathe, but just slowing down the pace and having it be smooth. And that changes um, the activity in this uh, cranial nerve called the vagus nerve, which is like paying attention to all the body. And then that, that sends information to the brain and that sends information to all your other organs. Like, oh, hey, maybe we should chill it out a little bit. Gratitude. This is one of the ones that we've, we've all heard for years. Do a gratitude journal, stop and count, you know, count your privileges, count what's going well for you. And I think a lot of people find out that works, but we don't know why that works. Yeah. What's happening in the brain with gratitude? Yeah. So there's a lot of things uh, that's happening. Um, so one of the things that can go wrong for people is like, we say to them, like, why are you depressed? There's so many good things in your life. And then, you know, be grateful for those. And so like, yeah, I, sh I do have, I have a wonderful house and like, I'm worried about my air conditioner, but like, you know, I have running water and like a great, you know, family. And I don't feel grateful for any of those things. I'm such an ungrateful, worthless person. <laughs> so like in trying to think about the things that we are grateful for when it doesn't immediately inspire some feeling of gratitude, we judge ourselves uh, harshly and critically. And therefore, why would I want to do that? Um, but it's really important to recognize that like, when I talk about gratitude, I'm not talking about feeling grateful. Your feelings are things that you don't have full control over. Mm -hmm. um, I'm talking about directing your attention towards the things in your life that you are grateful for. Like if someone asks you, like, are you glad you have a refrigerator? You'd be like, yes it doesn't need to change your feelings. Uh, but just by doing that over time, it starts to make it create a habit of making it more automatic to notice and pay attention to these positive things in your life. And sometimes it can bring your feelings along with you. Um, but uh, um, one of the effects that can have in the brain, there's two quick studies, one that show that just 
um, thinking of happy memories. Like, oh, these are the parts of yourself that like, yeah, they're always there. They're all, they will always be a part of your life. You're just not paying attention to them. So mm -hmm. just guide your attention. Yeah, I'm glad I, you know, had that, got that bike for Christmas when I was seven or like, yeah, I'm glad we got to take that vacation uh, last year. Like, well, that's better than thinking about all the terrible things in your life. And uh, that simple act of thinking of happy memories increases the production of serotonin in a key part of the brain's emotional circuitry, the um, anterior cingulate cortex. And there was another cool study where if you practice expressing your gratitude to people, like you write a thank you letter and you don't even have to send it to the person. Like you can be like, oh, I'm so you write it to, you know, dear, you know, ninth grade English teacher or whatever, like, oh, you changed my life when we read Huckleberry Finn or whatever. And like, I became, and just like, it doesn't matter if it was big or small or a long time ago or whatever, like just spend five or 10 minutes like writing and, you know, brain dumping out like all the reasons why you feel grateful and how much it helped you. And in fact, I think not having any intention to send it is helpful because sometimes we feel stupid about how much this little thing affected us, or we feel guilty that we didn't say it earlier. Right. Um, but just by expressing your gratitude, it essentially sends the message to your brain, like, oh, this isn't just something I'm saying that like, oh, I should, you know, think about more positive things. I'm actually doing it. It's the difference between telling yourself, I should get a new job versus going online and Googling different jobs that you can have. Like once you take action, it sends a signal to yourself like, oh, I really mean this. And when you take that action, it changes the way your brain perceives the world such that it's more likely to notice these positive things instead of filtering them out. It's the same way that Facebook works. When you click on a link, it's like, oh, that must be important to you. I'm going to show you a million of those same things. <laughs> so like when you think about things you're grateful for and take action to express them, it changes the, you know, the algorithm that your brain is filtering out information. And this, by the way, also is, you know, have you ever remember that book, The Secret on Oprah's mm -hmm. book club about manifesting? So like that's BS, like in that it doesn't work that way. Like you're not sending energy out into the universe and it's, you know, making things happen. And yet it feels that way. Like, and I say, oh, this is why manifestation seems to work. It's because when you take actions, it changes the way your brain perceives the world. And you start to see things that were already there, but you were just ignoring them. So not magic science. Yeah. <laughs> There's something in the gratitude chapter that I think has applications so far beyond that and even beyond the book. And that's a Cherokee legend that you mentioned about which wolf you're feeding. That's fabulous and can apply to so much in your life. Can, can you go into that? Yeah, I remember, I mean, I don't remember where I uh, first heard this, but it's the, the sort of fable of like, you know, a, a kid is asking his uh, you know, or his grandfather says to his grandson, like, you know, there, there are two wolves inside you. One represents, you know, fear and anger and jealousy. And the other is, you know, hope and kindness and love. And they're fighting each other. And the grandson asks like, well, which one wins? And he says, the one you feed. Uh, and this, I feel like was a good sort of metaphorical representation of the upward spiral that like, yeah, you have all of these complex brain circuits and they want different things. Your um, dorsal striatum wants to get you to do, the, the habit circuit wants to get you to do the things that you've done the most before. And your reward circuitry wants to get you to things, to do the things that are most immediately pleasurable. And your you know limbic system, the emotional circuitry wants to like, you to not do dangerous things and to keep you safe. And that's where you're, you know, your fear is located. And uh, the prefrontal circuitry thinking part, that's like once you're, you know, long-term goals, well, which 
should you uh, listen to? Well, it depends, you know, what's important to you <laughs> and what can you control? Uh, and it, it's not quite as simple as the, you know, the two wolves, uh, because like the brain is more complex than that. Uh, and like the same parts of your brain that are involved in like fear are also involved in excitement. But it just, the more that we're stressed out and fearful, then we start paying attention to say the negative consequences of our actions and how bad it would be if we made a mistake and how little control we have over the situation. Mm -hmm. On the other side is like, well, how important are the positive consequences and what control do you have over the situation? And both of those things could be true. I could, you know, be heartbroken because, you know, my girlfriend dumped me and I could say, well, you know, I don't want to experience this heartbreak again. And I don't know, you know, how to make someone love me. So it's easiest to just not go on any more dates. Uh, that's sort of the, um, like, it's true. There is that fear, but like, if you are guided by that fear, well, then you're not likely to take these positive actions because it's important to realize like, well, why are you heartbroken in the first place? You're not heartbroken because you don't care about things. You're heartbroken because it's really important to you to find a deep connection with someone. Right. And it didn't work out in this place. And so uh, it's, it's difficult. But reminding yourself of what's really important when you come to this fear of like, oh, but what if it doesn't work out? you have a response be like, yeah, that's true. What if it, it, it is possible that it doesn't work out and it's possible that I could experience this heartbreak again. So I could just avoid, uh, you know, all relationships, but that's the exact opposite direction of what would move me towards what's really important to me, which is find a deeper connection. So these things that are, you know, important to me to avoid are uncontrollable. And the only thing, only helpful path forward for me is to accept them, not because I want to, but it's like, yep, that's a possibility, but I'm going to be guided by uh, what is important to me and my values and my long-term goals, uh, even though it's scary and difficult. This has been great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. It's been wonderful talking to you. Good. And I hope everybody who has been listening and watching has gotten something out of it as well. And uh, just to remind you, the book we're talking about is The Upward Spiral. So uh, Thank you. I'm going to toss it back to Melissa. So thank you so much, Angie and Alex. This was wonderful. And a reminder to everybody who's watching, you can check our website in a week or so, and this will be up and available so that you can share it with others who may not have been able to attend today. This speaker series has been produced, uh, provided thanks to the generosity of our sponsors, Dignity Healthcare, Beacon Business Bank, Heritage Bank of Commerce, Ginny Stewart, Marilyn David Krasner, without whom these would not have been possible. If you enjoyed our speakers and would like to see more events like this, please consider making a donation through our agency website, mhasmc.org, where you will find more information about our organization, our current programs, and our future events. Thank you all again for your interest and support and for joining us for these important conversations. So it'll be interesting to see.
So it actually is just us now. So um, Sally has to get back on. She somehow got taken off, but she got fired. She got, she got fired from the Zoom. Sorry. Oh, Alex says it looks like we're still recording. <laughs>